Good morning. So y'all really need to remember that, that illustration about it. it. It matters what's on the inside. Because I've heard enough about my hair, all right? <laughs> I know, I change it like every other month. It's okay. It doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, man. That's all I could think about when she started saying that. It's like, especially if y'all were here for the revival we had Friday and Saturday night. Um, me and my wife, we recently got a, uh, a Jeep Wrangler. I've been wanting a Jeep Wrangler since I was 16 years old. And for one reason or another, I never got one. So finally, 30 years old, I got a Jeep Wrangler. And man, we love that thing. It's just been great. Um, but really, honestly, more than me and my wife loving it, y'all need to see Cora in this Jeep. Cora and Miles. Cora, she's my little girl. She's two years old. Miles is four. Cora, when she gets this thing, and we had to go to Riceville Beach to take some family pictures yesterday, so we took the Jeep. The whole time she's riding the Jeep, she's like this. <laughs> the whole time. So anytime you see us in the Jeep, you just try to get up beside us and look for Cora. She's crazy. It's so funny. But, uh, but anyways, for the reason I was saying that is because I just... Whenever I know I'm going to be in my Jeep, I'm like, there's no, there's not enough gel to keep my hair down. It's just going to be going. So, but anyways, uh, man, today is such an awesome, uh, it's an awesome, awesome privilege for me to be up here and, um, and to give a charge to Josh Cotton this morning. Um, I'm very excited and just very honored to be able to stand behind this pulpit um, to speak the word of God. And um, I'm very excited. Um, ministry is an awesome privilege. It's a great, great privilege to be a part of. And I remember the day that I was ordained. It was actually in this sanctuary. And I remember the day that I was ordained. After I got ordained and after the ordination service, um, I think I was out back and people were greeting me as I was leaving and saying the nice things that you say, which I really appreciate. Someone came up to me and he said, he said welcome to the ministry. And you know, I'll be honest, it kind of threw me off a little bit. Because I started to think, because I think sometimes the phrases we use as Christians, the labels that we put on stuff, it kind of hides the real truth. And see, the truth is, ministry is not just reserved for pastors and deacons and church leaders. But we're all in ministry. The people right now that are doing an amazing job taking care of our kids back in nursery so that we can enjoy this service right now. They're involved in ministry. You know, whenever your neighbor's not feeling good and they're sick and you make a meal for them and you take on them and you go over and love on them and talk with them and spend some time with them, you're ministering to them. Whether you're in Mexico with a group of kids that no one wants and you're over there to hang out with them and love on them and kick a soccer ball with them, it's ministry. You see, ministry does not have to be designated to a preacher or a deacon. Ministries from the pulpit to the playground, from the nursery to your neighbors. And you don't have to be ordained to be involved in ministry. As Christians, we are all given that charge to go out there and spread the gospel. See, sometimes we think that, you know, we'll, we'll hire a pastor and that's his job. We pay him to preach the gospel. We pay him to share Jesus. That's all of us. God has given all of us that special charge as believers to go out and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. We are all involved in ministry, wherever we are. If we proclaim the name of Christ, we are in ministry because ministry is service, and it's all important. Josh, like I said, I have the privilege today to give you a charge from God's Word. And I take this responsibility serious, and I take it as an honor. And because even though everyone is involved in ministry, there are some ministries that do require some qualifications. And so we're going to deal with a little bit of that this morning as I talk to you. Um, this morning, the main passage I'm going to be looking at is Acts chapter 6. Um, we're going to read it here in a second. But in the book of Acts, Luke does a great job recording some amazing things that were happening. Just some incredible growth that was happening in the church. I mean, it was explosive type stuff. So naturally, people were complaining. So the apostles, they gathered the believers together. 
so they could find some men to help out. Now, these men weren't specifically called deacons. I mean, they, they weren't all official in all business like we are nowadays. But they called some men together to serve the church. And it's where we get our word deacons from. And so they had certain things that Luke recorded that they were looking for in these men. And these three things is what I'm going to show you this morning. In Acts chapter 6, I'm going to be focusing on verse 3, but I want to read verses 1 through 5. So let's stand as we read God's word this morning to honor him and his word. Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It said, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. Father, I thank you so much for your word and how much your word means to us. God, I thank you that we have the privilege to come to this place this morning to open up your word freely and God share it. God, I pray for our brothers and sisters all across this country right now who do not get to experience this freedom that we do. I pray for the persecuted church. And as it is becoming more and more relevant in the media recently, it is still something that has been going on for a very long time. God, I pray you will continue to strengthen them. God, I pray for us that even though this message this morning is just specifically designated to Josh, God, I pray that the church would see how much your word applies to all of us and how much of a charge you have given to each of our lives to go out and be ministers in our neighborhoods, in our schools, at our jobs, at the playground, wherever we are. We are all ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would continue to... Put a fire under us every day to go out and spread that love. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I've got three things that I want to share with you this morning, Josh, and to the congregation. But as this morning, as I was looking over my message, I, I saw something else at the very beginning that I thought was very interesting. And, and God kind of hit me with it. So before I get to my three points, and like I said, most everything's coming from verse 3. But at the beginning of the verse 3, Luke says, that, Therefore, brethren, seek out among you. And I want to get, let's just get honest. I mean, y'all, I've, I've spoken up here a few times, and I get honest with you, and, you know, sometimes it gets me in trouble. But I read that, and I said, seek out from among you. You know, honestly, I'm here because you pay me. Let's just be honest. I'm here because God called me to this church, but ultimately, I have a calling to full-time ministry. And so because this church, we decided, like, hey, we want you to come on staff, and we want you to help our church. So I'm here because y'all pay me. Now, this church is doing amazing stuff, and I am so excited to be here. And I plan on being here for a while. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> but I enjoy being here. But you know what? In this passage, the disciples, they said, seek someone from among you. See, Josh, you and your family, you and your wife, you're here because you love the people here. And you know what, you're going to have, you know, for me, it's going to take a few years to build trust with the congregation, especially because, you know, honestly, this congregation has been hurt a lot. The youth have been hurt. They've had youth pastors leave. We've had pastors leave. We're in the in-between time right now. And it's hard to gain trust with that kind of background. So it takes a while for me to gain the trust of the people. It takes a while for me to gain the trust of the youth because pastors come and pastors go. But you're here because you love this church. You're being ordained a deacon because you love this church. And it's going to be a lot easier because you are among the people to gain the trust of the people. And I think that's a great thing. I think that's an awesome thing. But there's three things in this, in this verse that I want to give to you that I want you to remember. If you can remember anything from this, all the words I say, they're not important. But I want you to remember these three points of the, what the apostles were looking for for these men. First... It says, seek out among you seven men of good reputation. Number one, you need to have a solid witness. 
You see, the phrase good reputation here literally means to be a good witness. Not just within the body, but everywhere you go. People need to know about your love for Christ. You need to have a good witness. Wherever you might find yourself, you need to have a, the reputation of being someone that loves God. They were looking for people. Now you notice too that in this passage, this is not something that they were saying, hey, let's find people that have the potential of having these things. That's not what the apostles were looking for. They said, we want to find someone that has this. And so the deacons here, they feel that this is something that you have. And so I want you to remember, don't ever let it go. Because it's sad, as even we were talking with the students in Sunday school this morning in our small groups. Every single person in this room can think of somebody that, man, had a fire for God. And now you would never see them darken the door of a church. You would never see them crease, open up their Bible and read it. They've fallen away. They've made a choice. Have a good reputation. Be known as somebody who loves God. Be a good witness. Have a solid witness. Number two. Find seven men of good reputation full of the Holy Spirit. So you need to have a solid witness and you need to be spirit-filled. See, every part of who you are needs to be filled with the Spirit. You see, in church, a lot of times us as Christians, what do we like to do? But we like to separate out our lives. You know, we, we, we put on a good church face. We put on our, our nice church clothes. We come in here smiling. And like, oh, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. And we're hurting inside. But we put on these good faces. But then when we go to church, or when we go to work, rather... Man, it's a completely different face. It's got a completely different speech coming out of our mouths. When the students go to school, different speech, different ways. I remember one time when I was in high school, I was probably in 10th or 11th grade, and somehow the group of friends that I was with, now I was a Christian at this time, but somehow the group of people that I was with started talking about church. We didn't ever talk about church, but for some reason they started talking about church. And I happened to mention to them, oh yeah, I go to church, I go to youth group. And I'll never forget this guy's face, one of, my, one of my good friends. He kind of did that, huh? You know, you sometimes feel like he's giving you that weird look. And he looked at me and he's like, you're a Christian? Let me tell you, that hit me hard. Because I never talked about church. I never talked about God. You see, my life was not spirit-filled. I had segregated my life. I had the... I had uh, Sean, who was Sean with his parents, and the good boy I was with my parents. I had the Christian Sean when I was at church, and I had the wild Sean when I was with my friends on the weekends and at school. Don't segregate your life. Be spirit-filled. Fill every part of your life with the Holy Spirit. There's no, we do not need to segregate us. We do, God does not want us to have different parts, but we should be full, every part of us. No matter where we go, we should have a solid witness and we should be spirit filled. So don't let people say that, you know, I know, I know that work, I know the work, Josh. I know the church, Josh. I know the spouse, Josh. But who you are is who you are because you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Solid witness spiritually, spirit-filled, and spiritual wisdom. Find men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. You see, wisdom is knowing how to use the knowledge that God has given you. Spiritual wisdom is putting feet to the faith that God has. And I love how James put it. Oh, man, I love the book of James. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Listen to what the half-brother Jesus says. He says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself if it does not have works, is dead. 
And like I said earlier, our word for deacon comes from a Greek word that means servant. So my charge to you more than anything, Josh, is to be a servant. You see, being a deacon is not about getting to attend a meeting every month and hear the planning of the things that are going on at the church. Being a deacon is not about being a sounding board for people's complaints. Being a deacon is being a servant. Now here at Hampstead, we have the ministry of deacons set up as family ministry. So each deacon has certain people that, they would, that they're supposed to keep in contact with. So serve your assigned families. Love them. Keep in contact with them. Serve them. Serve the church. Have a servant's heart. And see, the one thing I love about servant is you don't serve for recognition. Servants serve no matter who's around. And it can be in the smallest things. But it doesn't matter who's around, but you just serve because of the love you have for God. Not caring if you ever get recognized for it. Serve your families, serve the church, but above everything else, serve God. Serve God. I want to close out my short time that I have up here with words that I think that Jesus explained this very well. Um, and church, this really isn't just for Josh, but this is for everybody here. In Mark 12, Jesus says, Then one of, the, or one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? So here's how Jesus responded. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first, first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. Solid witness. Spirit-filled. Spiritual wisdom. Love God. Love others. That's all it is. That's all it is for all of us. Love God. Love others. Father, I thank you for this time that I've been able to spend up here charging Josh. And God, I just pray that he would just take your word seriously as I know he does. God, I pray you would continue to enrapture his heart and bring him closer and closer to you. Lord, I just pray more than anything else that he would serve. He would have that servant's heart and just love on these people and love on this community. God, I pray for Joey as he's going to come up here and finish the charge this morning that, Lord, you would just speak through him and have an awesome word to give to the church. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you were to continue to read in Acts chapter 6, which we won't take the time to do today, but you will see that this first deacon, Stephen, um, was rose up against him and the testimony that he had the world did those outside of the church and he preached a sermon to him it is a fantastic sermon so i encourage you to read the rest of it and ultimately at the end of the sermon they stoned him absolutely stoned him stephen was not only the first deacon or one of the first deacons he was the first christian martyr as well so i hope i can slip out of here today without anything like that happening <laughs> Don't need any stoning after the sermons, but Josh, you have been sufficiently charged, and I would encourage you to read the rest of that as well, to be reminded of that, of what it entails to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for just a few moments, I want to take, kind of shift the focus off of you for just a moment, you and Sarah, and I appreciate all of your family being here today. It's just a wonderful thing to see, and kind of focus on the church for our remaining time together. So we charged... Josh as a deacon at Hampstead Baptist and now we will charge Hampstead Baptist of how to respond to deacons and how to deal with them. It's three quick things I want you to see and it's out of the book of Acts as well chapter 6. And down in verse 5 you'll see just this short little phrase and we're going to kind of launch from here. It's a little different than what I typically do and how I typically preach but I, I think it's appropriate today. In verse 5 in our text it says and what they said please the whole congregation. 
So Sean read the previous verses and the need for deacons, why they thought of it, why the Holy Spirit inspired them to do this kind of thing. And the congregation looked at it. The church listened to what the apostles said and they were pleased by what, it, what they said. So out of that, we're going to see three quick things for the church. Here's the first thing. It's kind of a realization thing for the church. That's what I want you to do today. I want you to, to realize this whole intention of deacons. First thing is realize the need for deacons. And we saw in verse 1 that there were complaints because and it's probably a proper time for complaints of the right way. There was logistically the church was growing and there were some real issues. Everybody was not being ministered to. So something had to happen. So there was a real need for some more service. And here's the first reason why. Believe it or not, I understand that pastors are superhuman, that they're, they're superheroes and all of that, but they cannot do it all. They just cannot do it. They cannot minister to everybody's needs. You think about this. A church of 250 members, that's a lot of people. If it were just those people alone, one man, two men, however, cannot minister to all of those people and all that they need. But it's not just the church members. It's their families, their neighbors. For how many times do we hear, Pastor, can you help me with my neighbor? I have a friend that's in the hospital. Can you go by and see him? So in one sense, it's the entire community that a pastor is servant to and is responsible for and that's a real thing so ultimately and you can see this one pastor two pastors even three or four cannot do it all so there's a real need to have some help there so that's what deacons are for and that's exactly what we see in this historical context of the book of acts where they needed help and we see this all throughout scripture you remember when the uh, israelites were in the wilderness and God ultimately said, designate some help, delegate some help. And so they put them in groups of 50 and so forth so the leader could kind of minister properly. This went on. You think of the feeding of the 5,000, the apostles themselves. So this was an, uh, a normal thing. God is a God of order. And that's what we see with deacons. Pastors cannot do it all, so we have deacons to help them. So realize the need for deacons. Now, we all, as Sean said, minister to each other. We're all servants. So don't for a moment think that pastors and deacons get you off the hook. We are all servants. We all submit to each other and serve each other as well. So realize the need for deacons. Here's the second thing. Realize that deacons are good for the church. When they are used properly when they are used biblically when they're installed properly then they are a very good thing for the church again as sean read you saw the one of the needs for it so the pastors so the shepherds can pray and so they can preach the word folks i've said this since i've been here many others in the past have said the same thing that this book is so precious to us and so very important to us. It is the breath of God. When we read it, in one sense, we're breathing the breath of God. It's an amazing thing. And we desperately need to know what it says. We desperately need to hear it and soak it in and bathe ourselves in the Word of God. For everything else we do in this church comes from here. This is the standard, the canon, the measuring rod for everything else in the church. So you have to have somebody that is going to pour themselves into it, understand what it says, and proclaim that to the church. And as much as pastors love people, as much as they want to spend all their time doing uh, with people, talking with people, ministering to people, they must be in the Word of God. You've got to have somebody to proclaim the Word. And praise the Lord, deacons help us to do this. By their love for people, by their ministering to people, they help pastors pull themselves into the Word of God and proclaim that to you. So every day, every week, you hear God speak. And what says because of deacons? It's an incredible thing that happens. So everybody gets ministered to when we have deacons. 
It's not just the pastor trying to reach everybody. It's all the deacons. And so everybody gets ministered to. The Word of God doesn't get neglected. So the church is strengthened and blessed and grows and so forth through the preached and proclaimed Word of God because we have deacons to help us in those areas. So realize the need for deacons. Realize deacons are really, really good for the church when they are used properly and biblically. And finally, this is a very practical thing, very just, just practical. And so we've seen that a lot in 1 Timothy and Ephesians that we've been going through. A lot of practical things, but ultimately they point to God's glory. Realize God is glorified and we are blessed when deacons are used properly. So not only is the church blessed and, and so forth, but God is glorified when we simply do things His way. Instead of trying to say, hey, I have a better way of doing it and we've got this figured out, just look at the Bible, see what it says. This is how you do it. This is how we practice it. And God is glorified in the midst of that. So I'm going to break this down in a couple of ways. Very practically, church, here's some things not to do with Josh and David and Daniel and Mark and Danny and Josh and Brian or, and, and Tom and Wayne and all of our deacons. Deacons of the past and deacons that we will have. Here are some things not to do. And Sean has, has touched on this a little bit already. Don't expect too much. I know Josh does look like a superhero. <laughs> I understand that. But he's not. He is wrapped in the same flesh that you are and that I am. He is... Human. He's very human, just like all of us. He has a family. He has a job, and you want him to have that. And believe it or not, he will mess up. He will make mistakes. Hopefully not nearly as many as I have made or others, but he will mess up. It's just part of being human. So realize that, and when he, when he does, know that he's not doing it, on, doing it on purpose. Of course not. He would, if it were, if he had... His ultimate way, he would never mess up or fail, but he's going to. So just realize that. He, he, uh, uh, he will absolutely mess up. And as a church, you realize that. But then don't speak evil of him. Just don't do that, folks. And again, I understand how easy that comes to us because we do have this fallen flesh wrapped upon us. And when somebody messes up, it's so quick to say, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. I knew he wasn't right for the job, or I knew this, or I knew that, or, or he shouldn't be this, or shouldn't be that. Just don't do that. Folks, it's clear. It's clear to us that God has called this man. We understand that now. He's already gone through that process. People have recognized something within him that God is, is working in him and dealing with him. And we've recognized that, and we've asked him to be in this position. So that's, that's done. That's, that's already assumed. But when he does mess up, if he does mess up, even if he does the right thing, do not speak evil of him. Just don't do it. As a matter of fact, don't speak evil of anybody. Just don't do it. Of your pastor, of the pastor that is to come, of your associates, your deacons, anybody, each other, just don't speak evil of them. That is a great witness when we don't speak evil of each other. And again, Sean mentioned this. Don't use him merely as a representative. That's not the way. I, I'm not sure where all of that came from. There's a time for that. But don't use him as taking your frustrations out on somebody else. It's not fair to him, and it's not fair to the person you're doing that to. So just be careful there. If there's an issue, then approach it properly and biblically in that manner. But be careful with that. But we don't want to be all negative today. We want to look at some positives of things you are to do as a church with Josh and the rest of our deacons. Here's the biggest thing. Kind of, again, we've already heard some of this. Loving. Just absolutely love Josh and Sarah and his family. Just love him. When you do that, he'll work his socks off for you. Support him. When you love him, you will support him. Pray for him. What a concept, huh? Just absolutely pray for him. Put his name up somewhere, especially if he's your deacon as a family. Put his name up and you pray for him. Again, this goes for Sarah as well. 
And then thank God for him. Aren't we blessed to have this organization of deacons and how God has set it up? We're blessed as a church. We have some, some awesome deacons in this church. Uh, and I'm, I'm very genuine about that. So thank God for them. It's an incredible thing to have deacons and to have them willing to give up so much. They don't get paid for this, you know, as pastors typically do and have to be in one sense. They just don't get paid for it. They're doing it because they love God and they love you. So folks, you come around him and Sarah and the rest of our deacons and you just absolutely love them and support them and pray for them and thank God for this couple. You are blessed to have them. I've been around ministry a long time now, <laughs> believe it or not, a long time, and I've seen a lot. You have some priceless deacons here. You thank God for them, and you love them, and you let them minister to you and uh, support them and make this a pleasurable experience for Josh and Sarah. Amen?